Ee, sevgili Açık Beyinler, sevgili dostlar merhabalar. Ee, bugün çok özel bir canlı yayında karşınızda olacağız. Ben önden kısaca bir Türkçe açıklama yapayım. Canlı yayınımız İngilizce olacak ve bugün e, hepimizin hayranlıkla takip ettiği bütün dünyanın tanıdığı Jill Bolte Taylor bizimle beraber olacak. E, yayınımız İngilizce olarak orijinal bu videoda yayınlandığı gibi bir de aynı zamanda simultane Türkçe çeviriyle ikinci paralel bir video olarak da yine kanalımızda yayınlanıyor. Lütfen video açıklamalarını ve sosyal medyayı takip edin. Eğer İngilizce takip etmekte zorlanıyorsanız öbür videoya bekliyoruz. Ve şimdi giriş konuşmasını yapmak üzere sevgili moderatörümüz e, Türkan Aydoğmuş'u e, sahneye davet ediyorum efendim. Hepinize iyi dinlemeler, iyi izlemeler. Welcome Jill again. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I'm very excited. Hello everyone. Welcome to our inspirational talks on the limits of science and information. As always, Professor Dr. Sinan Canan is here with me today. And we will be pushing boundaries with a world new scientist, Dr. Jill Bolte-Tay. She's a Harvard-trained and published neuroanatomist. Dr. Taylor is an extraordinary teacher and the New York Times best-selling author of My Stroke of Insight. In 2008, Dr. Taylor was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. She's just introduced us her new book called Whole Brain Living in May. And all the titles on the side, She's an extremely strong woman and she's my role model. Welcome, Jill. Welcome, welcome Thank to our you. talk. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Thank you. Yes, we are also so happy. I must also add that you are also our role model because I am a neuroscientist, uh, you know, for several years. But what you have done in your TED talk, uh, you're sharing this very, you know, unique experience with the world. Actually, I call it like an emotional science or something like that because a new uh, concept emerged in my mind after I heard you because uh, knowing from science is a different thing than experiencing indirectly. You experience something, some unique experience, and you shared with us all as the you know whole world. I would love to thank you for it. Thank you very much for having that courage and sharing all these insights with us. And welcome here again. It's very valuable for us. Thanks. Thank you. Jill, I, I feel very blessed. Yes. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Sina, if you allow me, I will go with the first yeah, question. Please. please. We would like to listen Jill from Jill, okay? But which one would be the right question? Who is Jill or what is Jill in this connected existence? Big one, isn't it? Um, so, so I think there are, are numerous characters inside of each one of us based on the way that our brain organizes information. So we have two emotional groups of cells, one in each hemisphere, and each one has a character. And then we have two thinking brains, one in each hemisphere, and they represent different voices inside of us or characters. So when you ask which Jill, uh, it's probably my left rational thinking tissue because she's the one who is rational and interacts with the external world. Uh, she's the part that knows to uh, put on my glasses, put on my earrings and show up on time. <laughs> Exactly right. So, well, um, Sina, would you like to go with the second question? Well, actually, yes. I'm wondering, well, in your distant past, what actually directed you? Which great motivation directed you to study neuroscience in the first place? Because uh, you're from 80s, right, like us. So in the 80s, or 70s or 80s, it's not that uh, popular subject in these right. days. So how did you choose this? What motivates you? Um, so I have a brother who is only 18 months older than I am, and he would eventually be diagnosed with the brain disorder schizophrenia. So as children, we were constant companions with one another, as children in a family are. And I recognized that my brother would perceive experiences very differently than I would. And that made me fascinated with what is normal 
And how can two people be so absolutely completely different from one another? And so that ended up studying the body, facial expression, body language, and then ultimately neuro. Yeah, very nice motivation, by the way. Did, uh, I, I have a little additional one. Did you, uh, do you feel yourself that you can understand, for example, situations like schizophrenia or autism or this um, inner different worlds in different people? Can you say neuroscience helped you understand about all of this? I would say that absolutely. I am a neuroanatomist who studies at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. So I care about which cells communicate with which other cells, with which chemicals, and in what quantities of those chemicals. So my research at Harvard was actually looking at different populations of cells in different brains of individuals diagnosed as normal control or schizophrenia, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, OCD, or panic anxiety. And we were actually looking at which cells are communicating with which chemicals and in what quantities. And it became very clear that the wiring of these cells was unique to each of those populations, different from normal. And if you're wired different from normal, there's no way that the, the brain can process normal. Yeah. Okay. So, so Jill, then those, those were genetics? Meaning, like, if I were born with that type of wiring, can I do anything with it? Or do I have a chance in life? Well, I think that we do. You know, the brain's a very big place. And there are a lot of different circuits doing a lot of different things. And different disorders, we call a disorder based on the behavior and the output of the system. So every ability I have is because I have brain cells that perform that function. So I may have a problem with language. I may have a problem with organizing sensory information. I may have a motor problem where I can't process normally my body, relationship to the body. So it all depends on where in the brain the problem is and which groups of cells are involved. So can we no help normalize certain systems? Well, we have to understand what the problem is and how the problematic behavior the circuitry underlying that versus the normal circuitry. And, and we're, we're quite naive with these subtle differences in which cell populations are having differences, et cetera, et cetera, in order to help normalize. But then absolutely, of course, we can influence the brain. I think antidepressants are a fantastic example of that, where if, if chronic depression, clinical depression occurs when there's too little serotonin being processed inside of the brain, then we can give medications that cause the serotonin to stay in the brain for longer periods of time and have more impact. So, um, so that's one change that ha can happen. And then because of neuroplasticity, the brain is constantly rearranging which cells are communicating with which cells, uh, in, in, you know, moment by moment by moment. And this is how we learn. So the, I, I, I always think there's hope. And, you know, based on my experience with stroke, uh, you know, I don't think anybody had really high hopes of how functional I would ever become. And I ended up becoming completely functional again. Yes. Well, that, that was the most interesting part for me. Can, can I go off topic a little bit? Because, uh, mm -hmm. because you mentioned, Jill, about <laughs> neuroplasticity. I, I'm just doing this. I just yeah. like to go off-road time to time. Um, you <laughs> talk about neuroplasticity, <laughs> and it's just yeah. I uh, listened to a lot of talk given by you and others, and you mentioned something about this 90-second uh, rule when we get uh, upset yes. and how to control our brain circuitry. Just before this yes. uh, broadcast, uh, I felt a little bit anxious because of some technical difficulties here. So I used your tactic and just wait for 90 seconds. So it just went mm -hmm. away. So can you please a little bit explain us uh, to this? 
um, how it works, how we cope with daily stress, and how can we get rid of this excessive and prolonged stress generated by our own minds? What, what to do about this? Yes, good. I'm so, first of all, I'm so glad that you used it and that it worked because it does. So uh, when we think about cells, Again, every ability we have is because we have cells that are performing that function. So technology starts having its you know, glitches and it is normal response of your emotional tissue, which are groups of cells in communication and in circuitry with one another to create for you the experience of anxiety. So you're thinking a thought, oh my gosh, we're about ready to go live and the technology is having a glitch. And that is stimulating an emotional circuit inside of your brain, which ends up resulting in the feeling of anxiety. And then you're going to have a physiological response to what you're thinking and what you're feeling. So your brain is going to dump adrenaline or noradrenaline probably into your bloodstream. It's going to flood through you. It's going to flush out of your bloodstream in less than 90 seconds. So I call this the 90 second rule or a 90 second reset. The same is true for any emotion. From the time we think the thought, it stimulates the emotional circuit and then it runs a physiological response. And that whole process from beginning to it's out of our blood is less than 90 seconds. Now, you're, you're, you know, probably a lot of people in the audience are saying, look, lady, I can stay angry for a whole lot longer than 90 <laughs> seconds, right? But what I'm doing, and what we're doing is we're rethinking the thought, re-stimulating the emotion, re-stimulating the physiological response. So we can run loops and loops and loops and we can stay angry for hours and days and decades so that, you know, there's probably somewhere in the back of your mind from somebody 20 years ago who every time you think about that person, you stimulate that, eh, they did me wrong or I'm feeling hostile about that. And then you rerun that physiological logical loop, but it probably comes and goes more quickly because it happened 20 years ago. But the brain is this beautiful pattern machine and it sells in circuits. And I think it really helps to understand that every time I'm feeling anger or every time I'm feeling anxiety or every time I'm feeling stress, it's a group of cells inside of my brain that are running that loop. And if it's a group of cells in my brain, then what power do I have to, to dissipate that power, take the power away and make a different choice instead and completely sidestep that circuitry altogether. So I'm a firm believer that we have much more power over what's going on inside of our heads than we have ever been trained. Explaining it beautifully, and I hope everyone adopts this strategy because we need it more and more every day, especially in this pandemic and unexpected days. You know, it's, it's very important. Thank you very much for summarizing with that clarity. Thanks, Turkan. Uh, I'm sorry for going off topic. Great practical, <laughs> practical solution that uh, audiences will will hopefully take it with uh, today as a message, right? With them. So I'm going to take the subject back to stroke because one of the reasons is May is the amount of stroke awareness, right? This month. And um, I'm going to ask you what is stroke. But before I ask you that question, my mom had two strokes. And the first stroke, she was able to come back 100%. I really worked with her and everything. But the second stroke, she's having a hard time even hugging me completely with full arms, right? Full both arms. But the question is this, what is stroke for a regular person for you? Because you became this hundred influential persons, right? People in the world after the stroke, whereas my mom is having a problem even hugging me completely, right? So stroke, right. we need to understand many directions, I guess. That's why I'm gonna open up that subject if you can. Perfect. Yes. So, you know, stroke, first of all, stroke is a medical emergency. So it's really important that I always encourage people that if they have anything that I call a neurological weirdness, um, mm -hmm. call, call for help. 
Uh, in the States, of course, it's 911. In Turkey, I don't know what your emergency line is, but call for help. So a stroke from a, a medical perspective, there are two different types. Uh, we can throw a blood clot at, that travels into the brain and the blood vessels start large and then they get more and more narrow as they taper smaller and smaller. So a blood clot can enter into a pretty big sized blood vessel and then get smaller and smaller and then block that blood vessel. And what that means, that blood vessel is providing oxygen to the brain cells that, and they, they have to have the brain, they have to have the oxygen in order to function. So that's technically a, a ischemic, it's called ischemic in English, an ischemic stroke, which is a blood clot. The other type mm -hmm. of stroke is if a blood vessel has a break in it. And if a blood vessel, I wish I had something. Uh, if you have a blood vessel, which is like this, and it's carrying blood from one place to the other, and then for some reason there's a tear in that blood vessel, then the blood is going to go out into the cells. And the thing about the cells is that in the brain is that blood is actually toxic or poison to blood cells, so to brain cells. So uh, in a hemorrhagic stroke, the blood goes out where the cells are and then the cells die or they become traumatized and uh, they, they no longer function. So a stroke is a brain trauma. And the warning signs of a stroke, in the event that you ever think you might be having a stroke, I think of it as S-T-R-O-K-E. I just break it down to the word stroke. S stands for speech or any problems with language. If all of a sudden I'm trying to speak with you and blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, instead I'm, I'm giving you, you gobbledygook, then, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, then that's a warning sign of stroke, problems with language. S, T is tingling or numbness in the body. And it's usually on one side of the body. It's usually not bilateral on both sides. So S, speech, T, tingling, R is remember, problems remembering anything um, all acutely, quickly, not over long term as we naturally uh, uh, may deteriorate or stress our system. But if all of a sudden I can't think of anything or remember anything, or I even like see my mother and I I don't even recognize my mother, then are um, um, uh, thinking. Uh, so S-T-R-O feels off balance. If all of a sudden I have paralysis in my arm or paralysis or weakness in my leg or I, it, my, I can't feel it whatsoever, then I go off balance. So O stands for off balance. K stands for killer headache. Now, usually I'm gonna have a killer headache when I have it, but not always. And E is a problem, an immediate problem with vision, a problem with eyes. E is for eyes and vision. So if all of a sudden I'm just, no, I can't see straight or I have big black spots in my, in my visual cortex, these are warning signs of stroke. And one of the things about stroke is that the sooner we get to the hospital or get to the doctor, the better the overall prognosis happens because a stroke starts as a, a focal point, a point, and then over time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, it's getting bigger by wiping out more cells that have different functions. So the more severe stroke can happen over time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so then as we go uh, to your question about, you know, why did I recover and, and why might your mother recover more from her first one than the second one? Every ability we have, we have because we have brain cells that perform that function. So the brain is a very big and specialized place. And depending on where your mother's first stroke was, it might have been in a position where perhaps it was in sensory awareness. So have problems, so many problems with movement. She wouldn't have so many problems with higher cognition, but she might have undetected 
uh, sensitivity or lack of sensitivity in that part of the brain because those cells aren't just kind of like obvious to anybody. And then with the second stroke, if she's having a problem hugging you, um, perhaps then her motor system has been impacted. And so that is more obvious because we're constantly moving and we can identify when we're not. Um, I do believe that I, uh, one of the reasons why I did recover well was I believed in the ability ability of my brain cells to recover. And I, because I had a training as a neuroanatomist, which meant, means I think in circuits. So as I hear sound, I think about which cells are in which parts of the brain, what's the wire board, if you will. So I think that way. And so I could look at something and say, well, I don't have the ability to create sound. Well, I know what part of the brain would do that. And, and so I think I had a, a tremendous advantage. However, the biggest advantage was that neuroplasticity is real. And when we know how to uh, set ourselves up for success, we then can gain more success. Actually, Jill, you answered my question also very well as far as timing is very important. In the first stroke of my mother, we called 911 right away because I could tell it, she was having a stroke because she was losing the sight. But the second stroke came very sneaky way. We couldn't tell. And it, I think we approached it later. So I think timing is also very important key. And I, I am glad you shared all that SDRO. KE because then people can check with themselves if they're going through something exactly. sneaky way, they should call for help. So uh, uh, thank you for that. Definitely. Uh, Sinan, do you have a question? Otherwise I can go on and on and on, you know me. Well, actually, um, <clears throat> uh, for the new audience that uh, know Jill Bolter Taylor for the first time, she had a marvelous TED talk. Please watch her TED talk because it's uh, quite life changing, mind boggling. Uh, as a very uh, rapid summary, she had a stroke in the morning, right, to the left side of the brain, and then she tries yep. to reach the phone but not unable to speak, so she experienced some interesting stuff inside her mind, and in her talk and also in her book, she beautifully describes this horrific event. Actually, if you think about this from inside, this is a horrific mm -hmm. event. It's very hard to bear it because you're all perception all world is shattering and changing so it's actually very brave to share such uh, an experience to everyone like this but i'm wondering one thing after that event you went to, through a very hard time in the hospital recovery uh, procedure and so on but after that several years passed right now what is changed in your life in general how do you uh, consider yourself because if you ask me, you're not the only person that having that stroke. As the world as a whole, we also had the same stroke with you because you shared your insights with us and we felt something about it. So it changed us in certain degrees because I know myself before your talk and after your talk. So some stuff has mm -hmm. changed. What has changed in you? How life changed after that? I know it's a big question, but if you can make a summary, mm -hmm. I would be very glad. Uh, I think that that for for me, the biggest difference between for me personally was um, I now went. OK, so so there's a group of cells in the left brain that define the boundaries of where I begin and where I end. And because of those cells, I know that my face is my face and these glasses are not my face. And if I don't have that group of cells, then I don't have any boundaries of where I begin and where I end. And I know that sounds weird, but it is true. I have to have those cells to be an individual. And part of being an individual is uh, me having an identity. And my identity then becomes Jill Bolte Taylor. I'm an individual, I'm separate from everyone. And I have a rational left brain that allows me to interact with the external world, with language. But the whole information coming in through my sensory systems gets funneled through this filter called me, the individual. If I lose that left hemisphere, which is what happened for me, I lost that group of cells defining the boundaries of where I begin and where I end. 
I became, in my perception in my right hemisphere, I became as big as the universe. I know that sounds weird, but I didn't have that group of cells saying, here's the holographic image of me, the individual, separate from everything else. I instead blended the energy of me in with the energy of everything. So I became literally as big as the universe and I was caught in the flow. Language is in the left hemisphere, so I didn't have language. And I just, I was, I was big picture. I, everything was big picture and it felt like love, pure, unconditional love. So what I gained, and whenever anyone ever has a brain trauma, I always ask myself, what has this person gained? They may have lost the ability to have language or lost the ability to speak or lost the ability to know the boundaries of where they began. So what did they gain? And what I gained was this clear understanding through the eyes of a person who had studied the brain. What does that right hemisphere do when the left hemisphere is turned off and it's no longer reaching across inhibiting what's going on in that right hemisphere? So I shifted into what I would call the flow. And many people would say this is more of a spiritual experience. So then I go through this process of recovery. I regain my language. I regain the language of my academics and I become left brain and I become whole brain now. And what I gained was this clear understanding of what's going on in each of these hemispheres. But I think what everyone else gained was a clear understanding that science may be in our left brain, but our experience of spirituality is in our right brain. And what that means is science and spirituality are compatible. Now, the scientific method, by definition, is linear thinking. You have to have A after that, B after that, C, linear thinking. What that means is I know I have to put on my socks before I put on my shoes, before I tie my strings. I have to have a left hemisphere for that. The scientific method, by definition, has these different steps. And we could use the scientific method to prove that I can put on my shoes and tie my shoes because there is that method. And we can repeat uh, for the scientific scientific method, an experiment has to be repeatable. So the left brain and the way we look at the scientific method is absolutely fantastic for studying anything in the external world through our left hemisphere perspective but it is not capable of understanding the big picture collective whole where everything is a context because everything is too big to be measured by that left hemisphere. So I think what the world gained following that TED talk was a real clear understanding that these two very opposite ways of perceiving the world, one expansive and open, collective whole. We are one human family. There's no division between the two of us or any of us. And then the left hemisphere that defines the boundaries of where we begin, where we end, our relationship with specific, excuse me, details in the external world. <clears throat> going smaller, smaller, smaller in the right hemisphere, going open, open, open. So I know that, that that's one thing that, that I'm clear that, that that TED Talk did offer to the world. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sinan, if you allow me what I'm going to do, I have two good questions <coughs> from the audience. Mm. Sarai Chirak, thank you for the question. Jill, uh, her question is, uh, Jill mentioned the cells which are causing panic, anxiety, and other disorders. Can she explain what happens in my brain when I have a panic attack from a neuroscientist perspective? Absolutely. So when we experience panic, panic is part of the alarm, alarm, alert, alert, I don't feel safe circuitry. And when we look at a human brain, I'm going to use a human brain. Well, it's not a human brain, but it's a model. So as we look at a brain, this would be the front of the brain. This would be the back of the brain. And this would fit inside of my head like this. When we open this up, we're going to have emotional tissue in here. And we're going to have thinking tissue 
in here. And what happens with anxiety is some of the cells in the amygdala right here is going to be its job. Those cells, all they do is they ask the question moment by moment, am I safe? Am I safe? And for some reason, something happens, whether you're aware of it or not, whether it's a thinking idea or something happens and you have some residual response, you move into anxiety because that group of cells is hitting the alarm, alarm, alarm, alert, alert, I don't feel safe. And it just, it's gonna run for its 90 second once it's triggered. And then we know we can stay anxious for much longer than 90 seconds. But it, to, the, the important thing about fear or anxiety is that these are cells inside of our brain that are designed to save our life. So when you do feel anxiety, we have the capacity. Now, the other thing when I'm feeling fear or anxiety, it's like all the energy in my whole brain goes to that, right? I can't think about anything else. I don't know what's going on. I don't feel, I, I just feel like alarm, alarm, I'm not safe. And so remembering that that's just a small group of cells inside of the brain allows us to actually dissipate, bring our mind into the present moment, observe the fact that we are having an anxiety attack. What does it feel like? Observe what it feels like inside of your body. Your shoulders probably go up. You probably clamp your jaw. Your shoulders probably move forward. You're decreasing the amount of, of oxygen that, that happens in the lungs when we're relaxed. Um, you, you know, what happens to the furrow in your brow? Uh, you know, you probably start to pace like a wild animal. I mean, it's, it's like, we, we don't want to lie. We know what that feels like, right? It's a horrible feeling. But to be able to purposely choose and observe what does it feel like to experience this allows your all the energy in that anxiety circuit to pull into the other parts of your brain that can actually observe what's going on. What is my physiological response when I don't feel well because my anxiety or my fear circuit or my anger circuit has been triggered? So it's so important to remember this is a group of cells, a tiny little group of cells that has the the power to completely hijack us for, because it, all of a sudden it decides we're not safe. And if we're not safe, it is its job to push away and to, to get me out of here. Yes. I hope that Thank helped. You, Jill. Yes, I think so. That's a great uh, answer, actually. So I have another good question here. Bashak Özal. Thank you, Bashak, for this question. I want to ask how Jill's perception of outer world change after the stroke. Has her understanding of real and unreal changed? If yes, how? Well, that's a big question because then you have to ask, well, what is real? So are we defining real things that are like, this is real because I can touch it and I can play with it and I can analyze it and I can use it? Uh, are things that I perceive in the external world as real? Or is it real for me to observe someone who is um, uh, try, uh, try, um, set, talk, speaking to me and I am, uh, I am using my right hemisphere to observe their facial language or how they're holding their body in response to what they're saying to me? Is it real for me to be able to use my more intuitive big picture right hemisphere to be able to detect if someone's telling me a lie? So, um, so, you know, that's the first question is what's real. So what did I gain with this is recognizing that it, it is real. Um, my left thinking group of cells, they perceive the external world as real. My left emotion is the emotion and pain from my past experience. Well, my pain is real. My right emotional group of cells are the experiential of the present moment. It is real how I can detect the level of humidity in the air. Some days it's really dry and sometimes it's really moist. I can detect what does the clothing on my body, the experience of the present moment feel like that is real. And then my connection to a higher power through my right thinking brain 
for me, if I pray and I believe in something beyond and greater than I am, which happens because I wipe out that left hemisphere, then my relationship with my, my God or my cosmic consciousness or my infinite being or whatever label you like to apply to that, that's real too. So I think that, that perhaps that's the answer to the question is I think it helped me really perceive that it's all real. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. See, now I'm going to give it to you. But before I give it to you, I want to ask your fiance's question. Miguel, Miguel just sent me a question. Miguel Doan. Thank you, Miguel. She's asking that oneness feeling you had during the stroke. Did they, did you still feel it after that, after the stroke? Do you still carry on that or every once in a little while it happens? What is the feeling? How, how, how do you tap into that or do you even leave that point? I don't know. How, what is it after that? Yeah. That was a lot of different questions. So I'm going to give you a few different answers. Question okay. number one is um, yes. The answer is yes, I still tap into that. That consciousness of being connected to everything to me was a deep, deep feeling of love. And I believe with every ounce of my being, with every cell in me, that our number one job is to love one another. That's our job, is to love one another. Beyond that, then we have the ability to interact with one another and to learn things and to experience emotions and to share in relationship with one another. But our job through that connection to all that is through my right thinking tissue is to love one another. So I come from that space. And my agreement with, my, with me was that I needed to bring cell circuits from my left brain back online. I needed to get language back so that I had language to communicate with my fellow man. I needed to have that group of cells that would define the boundaries of where I begin and where I ended. I needed that because I needed to become an individual again. However, my agreement with myself was that I would recover as much of my left hemisphere as I had to in order to be able to pursue my new mission. And I have to say that my mission is to share this message. We are love. We are this magnificent life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And the better we understand what we are as living beings, then it becomes an, oh my gosh, wow, awe-inducing, awe-inspiring sense of gratitude that I exist at all. And when I live my life in that level of gratitude, then everything else works out better well jill you are making me cry right now i'm gonna pass it to sinan sinan you go ahead and ask questions because Whenever i watch yeah. your ted talk i always cry so it's not no stranger to me just just feel comfortable um well you said science our profession it's going to be a professional question by the way our profession science is about linear thinking and about left hemisphere but in order to understand the meaning, the core meaning, you need the right hemisphere. So after your incidents, how do you reconcile these two? For example, uh, making science is changed for you or you're doing the science as it was before, but you are generate some kind of meaning out of it. How it works right now? So when I experienced the stroke, I lost everything. And then it took, and I was 37, and then it took eight years for me to recover everything again. And I decided that I was 100% again when the first thing that left me was that group of cells that defined the boundaries of where I began and where I ended. So the first thing to go in recovery is generally the last thing to recover. So it took eight years for me to feel as though I was a solid instead of a fluid. So by that time, I, I became a different character. The scientist whom I had been, that woman died on the morning of the stroke. 
And it was never my job or never my goal, shall I say, to recover her completely. So it was never my goal to go back into the lab. It was never my goal to go back and pick up the research that I had been working on previously. And what I gained, however, in this process was a different voice for teaching others about the brain. And so the TED Talk happened, and when that happened, my whole life changed. And my life changed, I think, because people looked at the experience that I had had, and we as a society, we understand so little about the brain and how it works. And so I became a major advocate for educating the public about this beautiful organ. So I'm no longer in the lab. So my science actually is science that whoever replaced me in the lab, it would have been a little different. It would have been a little different, but that's not my calling this time around. I all but died that day. And I could spend my life back in the lab because I love cells and I love looking at them under the microscope. They're so beautiful. I miss teaching. I, I, I still do teach uh, gross anatomy, cadaver lab, neuroanatomy. Um, but as far as the research, I've allowed the other scientists to do that while I bring a different level of awareness to people about who and what we are as these beautiful collections of 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses. So my mission has shifted. I think part in the diversity of human beings in the realm of science, because in the realm of science, everyone behaves uh, like the other one, you know, they do almost the same thing. But some people need to go forward and tell what does it mean to know all of this? What is the meaning of all of this for human beings or humankind to uh, make our lives better? Actually, the logo you see up there, Açık Beyin, actually translates directly into English like open brain, two words. And actually, People always ask me, what is Açık Bey and why do you call open brain uh, to your you know, group? And I try to explain it, but right now in this broadcast, I can just point my fingers towards you. Yeah, th here is an open brain, here. Now there's an open brain person, an Açık Bey person. Actually, we are trying to do the same thing and I believe, we believe as a group, the brain science and what we learn from it can elevate us as human beings Absolutely. as uh, if we can derive the right meaning and the shared meaning from all of this. Probably this is why you are the, one of the most influential uh, persons uh, among our friends. We, we love you very much and thank you very much for this very, very nice explanation for all of this. I'm quite excited at the end, but <laughs> thank you very much again. Oh, uh, this, you know, for, for, yes. Go ahead. Please go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I, I, I'm just here to say, you know, thank you, because I agree absolutely completely that the better we understand the marvelous nature of what we are, then the better we treat ourselves and the better we treat one another with higher levels of reverence and grace. And none of us come into this world with a manual on how to get it all right. And love and forgiveness, I need to be loved and I need to be forgiven for my foibles and we all do. So so thank you for the open brain because you're absolutely right. The more open we are about who we are and what we are and what others are, you know, the better the world, the better we will get along. And um, uh, isn't that what we want? We want to heal humanity. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, Jill, I'm getting a lot of interest. Audience is asking a lot of questions. If you're okay, can I ask you more? If you have time, a little more sure. with us. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Edebiat Sever, thank you, Edebiat, for the question. How fake memories are created by brain? How is it possible to have fake memories? So, mm. the question is about memories. Mm. 
are they fake? And then is it created by the brain? Yeah. You know, it, memory is very interesting. It's so, it's so complex that we don't in science, we, it's not like we have a group of memories in our brain. Um, memory is an associated division of an experience that has thousands of bits and pieces that get spattered and organized. Um, we don't understand memory, frankly. So, but we do understand that the more times we rerun a memory, the less true that memory actually becomes. So we don't understand. I mean, that's a great question because that's definitely a stump the neuroscientist. And unless, sir, you have a better answer to that than I do. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, I had a program in my YouTube channel called the question and answers. Actually, I received that question. They probably the similar question, but I also couldn't give a you know, straight answer to no, it because no. <laughs> okay, another question, Habibe Eroğlu. Thank you, Habibe. What does Jill think about meditation for the health of our brain? Oh, I love meditation. So meditation is a tool that we can use with our left brain to shift from the consciousness of me, that tiny group of cells defining me as the individual, yeah, the me, the ego, me, the language center. I mean, isn't the goal to kind of quiet or at least stop paying attention to what our left brain is saying to us so that we can shift into the consciousness of our right hemisphere where we can feel more open, more expansive, more relaxed, more connected to everyone and to all life. So I'm a, I'm a true fan of, of meditation. I think it's a great tool that we can use uh, to find our own peace okay thank you and another question from melis melis thank you i don't know her last name how can we improve or develop the right brain so that our connection to our higher self gets stronger I love that. So meditation is one option. Prayer, if our prayer allows us to actually reach and connect with that part of ourselves that feels more open. But otherwise, the goal, in my opinion, is to be able to feel more expansiveness. So outside is a great place to go if you are you have the ability to go into nature. And what I do is I don't focus on details. I focus on energy. I know that's a weird thing to say. So what does that mean? So I will look at a collection of trees and you probably see some trees behind. And there's a tiny movement in some of those leaves and, excuse me and there's some little dust particles and little pollen there's a lot of pollen in the air i let my brain not focus on the detail but i let my eyes focus like in front of that so what's behind it is blurry and then there's a slight movement that's happening in the background and i don't become the leaves that are moving, but I shift into the energy that is moving those trees. And when I do that, I suddenly shift out of the part of my brain that's focused on the detail, and it opens me up to focusing on what is energetically moving those things that are moving. So I become the energy of the movement, not that which is moving. So another one, a bird. Let's see, I do this all the time with birds. So you see a bird and you feel it soaring, right? And you can just think, oh, I wish I was a bird. And it soars. And you can feel it lift or you can see it turn. And I'm not the bird. I'm the wind beneath its wings. I'm the energy that lifts and moves that bird the way that the bird moves. And for me, that works. <laughs> I think it works for me too. Really? <laughs> playing so greatly. Yes. Awesome. And, um, and, and there are more questions. And there are the questions. Thank you, audiences. Excellent. Yasemin 
Uh, Yasemin's question is, thank you, Yasemin. What is the best thing to do when a panic attack starts? Can Jill give us an advice that would really help in that moment? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to say, uh, first thing is breath. Always go to your breath. Because if I'm experiencing anxiety, now I'm running a loop. Okay. Cells in circuit running a loop. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I'm going to sweat. I am sweating because it's hot here, not because I'm having anxiety, but um, I'm going to have all of these physiological responses as a part of that anxiety response. Observe it, feel it. What does it feel like inside of my body? Breathe, breathe more deeply, settle yourself down allow your shoulders to pull down, allow yourself to breathe slower and more deeply and bring your mind to observing the physiological response that you're having. We have the ability to let that 90 seconds happen and then let it go. And if you practice that by bringing your mind to the present, yes, I'm freaking out. Yes, da, da, da, da, I hate the way that this feels. Well, it's not about hating the way that I feel. It's about what am I feeling? Observe yourself. Become aware of what is happening at the level of your body. As you do that, you're taking the energy out of the, I feel anxiety, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, to... I am observing myself feeling anxious. So you're actually physiologically pulling the energy out of the anxiety circuitry. It's going to run its loop for 90 seconds, but you're allowing the rest of your brain to also have an awareness. And then when that panic attack or anxiety attack is over, that's when you say, oh my God. I'm alive and I am capable of freaking out with anxiety. I know what it feels like to have anxiety. That was so exciting. Oh my gosh, I wonder when I get to do it again. And then you look forward to it. And then it's probably not going to happen because it's like it doesn't have the overpowering, oh my God, I'm going to die power over you anymore. So we give. We can hook into that circuit and give the circuit all the power or we can pull the power away. But I i always say, I don't mind if you're miserable and I don't mind if you suffer as long as you enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> as long as you enjoy it. Because being able to experience anxiety or fear or anger or whatever it is. Now, I'm not promoting that we want to run these circuits all the time, but those are the differences between us being alive and us not being alive. You know, we don't need that level of anxiety anymore because we don't have lions chasing us out on the prairie anymore, right? But biologically, our our emotional nervous system has not caught up with our level of civilization. So we still have this circuitry and it, we need to be grateful for it because this is the circuitry that saves our lives and we need it. We absolutely need it. If there's a bus coming at me, I need some anxiety to get out of the way of the bus but I don't need to stay and run that loop over and over again. But I, every time I have an adrenaline flush through me, I always go, wow, that was amazing. Just like that. It's like whoosh right through me. Pay attention to what a phenomenal physiological entity you are. Show appreciation and gratitude for it. And it becomes more of a friend to you. Thank you, Jill. Actually, Sinan, I'm going to ask you, do you have anything to do about it? Because he uses this, uh, you know, um, this anxiety, like how we need that because we used to run away from a lion. Now we don't have to, but, you know, we still need it when it is needed. Right. So, Sinan, do you want to say anything about it? We cannot hear you, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. No. <laughs> okay. In my book, Humans Default Settings, it's in the Turkish, but it's, it's being translated into English right now. I am actually denoting a chapter to this, uh, the stress, because we are the only creatures that can generate mental stress. As Jill pointed out very beautifully, <clears throat> sorry, 
we always think about the things that are, did not happen yet or happened before and you, the, the things that you cannot change in the past. So we, we always mentally go to the past and future and generate stress and anxiety. The first thing I am advocating that we should be aware of is this mind wandering between the past and the future. So the best way to get rid of this is actually understand this moment, understand now, and actually Jill beautifully portrayed it, especially that bird example just blew me away because this was quite similar something that I do from my childhood. I was trying to imagine myself as the air itself. I, I would love to think myself as the air because air is not visible but we can feel it. So uh, it was just a game for me but it's probably a right brain exercise. Now I learned this probably and, and I, I love right brain exercise including drawing. By the way I must say <clears throat> this broadcast is probably the most informative and most emotional one we had so far. Really, I, I, I'm genuinely saying that. I'm very glad that we have you here. Thank you very much for being with us. And that was marvelous. And also my students are watching. I know that because I just uh, notified them. Please re-watch this talk. Re-watch this again and again, three or four times, because I'm going to ask this to you at the exam, <laughs> upcoming exam, <laughs> because Ooh. you need to learn what Jill has covered here. And Every sentence is important because it's coming from experience. It's not coming from the books. And that's, that's what matters for me. Thank you very much. I just want to say that. I'm grateful. Thank you. Jill, I have Thank one you. last question here as well from audience. Dana Pusharan, Thank you, Dana, for this question. What if the stroke happened opposite side of her brain? Which kind of experience it could be? Which one does Jill prefer to feel? Not the left, but if it was right, what would happen? And which one would you prefer? Oh, there's no question for me that, well, first of all, I have had many people who have had right brain trauma write to me and say, uh, I'm not having that experience at all. What I'm finding mm. is that I'm routinizing on details, details, more details. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of all about criticism and I'm not very happy and I cannot find God. Oh, wow. And to me, that's profound. I cannot find God. And so what that says to me is that the circuitry of that left hemisphere that is designed to process all of those details, well, the details isn't where our true meaning is and our true sense of love and connection to everything that is greater than we are. So I personally would much rather, everybody says, oh, so so-and-so had a stroke and they say, well, uh, can they speak? Do they have language? And then the answer is yes or no. And if it's yes, then it's like, oh, good. That means that the stroke was probably in the right hemisphere. And I think to myself, oh, my, um, I would much rather have lost my language because that's a skill I could possibly relearn. How do we teach someone what it feels like to feel God? I mean, that's just, you know, schools are designed to teach us reading, writing, and arithmetic and language, but school's not designed to teach us those right brain skills. So that's my answer. I would much rather have a right brain, a left brain stroke, wipe out my skills in the external world, and then go back to school, essentially, and relearn. Right. Jill, that's interesting. And then I'm getting uh, messages here. They're saying that they're crying. My <laughs> friends, they all are crying right now. But um, so that brings me to this question, uh, which I see it here too. <clears throat> what, what did you have changed? Uh, did you have anything changed? Because you had a some kind of fate beforehand, I assume. I don't know if you're Christian or I'm Muslim, for example, right? And uh, when you went to oneness, coming back, I mean, I have this, all these different religions were dividing into pieces, which I don't understand, but I feel like oneness should be everywhere, up there, in here, everywhere. So for you, what happened your 
uh, fate, maybe. Did it change yes. anything for you? Well, I, I, you know, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere have completely different values. So to me, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere have different faith-based, <coughs> excuse me, tickle, um, faith-based skill sets. So the left brain <clears throat> is cultural. I'm in a Christian culture. So I grew up in Christianity. I grew up with, uh, my father was an Episcopalian minister. So mm. <clears throat> my left brain was very based on my culture, Christian. When I lost my Christianity, even prior to learning that, I always resonated because I was very strong right brained as a child. I was very artistic, very musical, very athletic in my body. And these are all values and structures of, you know, the relationship with the right hemisphere. And I, I enjoyed Native American study because I, it appealed to me. I like knowing the totem animals and guides. I like having a relationship with nature. I like it. To me, it's very meaningful the cycle of the moon and the relationship between the moon and the planets. So for me, again, it was very Native American. Um, after the stroke, um, I lost my left brain. So I lost all my structure and education related to my Christianity. And I became love. And as we spoke earlier, sir, the earlier we were speaking to me, I essentially became Sufi. I became Buddhist because Buddhism to me is this, this love, just this love is the energy within which we swim and within which we live and within which we have our existence. And so, um, so I'm, I'm probably what one would call confused <laughs> because we're all of it, you know? Aren't we? We're all of it. Oh uh, yes. And yes. Um, you know, and and so much of religion, I draw a very diff, very large gap between religion and spirituality, because to me, mm -hmm. spirituality is is our relationship with um the, with the co the collective whole, and call that God, mm -hmm. call that Allah, call that call that call it whatever you want to call it, but it's the left hemisphere. And the culture within which we believe in structure of the external world and how we organize that information, and that's the dogma, and that's what we read, and that's what we practice, and that's what we, how we perform. So to me, our structured organizational religion is a product of that left hemisphere. And ultimately, in my opinion, the goal of I think every religion, but I can't say that for sure because this is not my area of expertise. The ultimate goal of any religion, whichever the story, the story of Christ or the story of the Buddha or the story of, of Muhammad, whatever the story, the ultimate goal is to connect to that which is greater, to connect to our God or our, our whatever we call that. So um, I think that the goal of the religion is to experience the, our relationship with that, which is, is we are a part of. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. It's so nice to hear from you. Uh, I want you soon and maybe let you go. But before that, two more questions. Sinan, do you say anything? Because they're asking me like very nice question. Maybe we, we should have you later on when you have the new book and all that. But I don't know. Sinan, do you have questions? But I have two questions because they're asking Yusuf Gumush. Thank you, Yusuf. How can I get, get rid of obsessive compulsion? So, I mean, I want to bring those questions out because maybe you have some tips for them. Maybe scientifically, maybe you cannot tell them to go read something. I don't know. That's why I'm bringing it up. Those kind of questions, yeah. So, so OCD um, is um, uh, it's actually a neurological phenomenon that benefits from medication. So, I mm. am not a neurologist. I am not a physician. Uh, so, I cannot mm -hmm. give you really medical advice on that. But if you truly are 
uh, connected into uh, loops because essentially you're running loops over and over and over again. Um, so, so yeah, that, that one's really beyond my area of expertise. Okay. At, at least they know what to do. Um, yes. It starts to be a Sian, but I'm going to ask one more question and then if Sian doesn't have anything because I'm going to thank everyone here asking questions. We cannot ask Jill the whole day all these questions, but maybe later on we can have you again. My question is, what do you think about death? People are scared of death. Ah. It's almost like you oh. and came back. I don't know. I mean, what is that for you? I mean, oh. I love this question. Um, to me, the consciousness of the universe, think about when we're first conceived and we are that single cell, that single cell with half the DNA from mom and half the DNA from dad, the zygote cell. And the zygote cell has a consciousness and DNA. It has an energy. And that energy is the shared energy of the universe. So for me then, that single cell will multiply the DNA and then repackage that DNA. Multiply those DNAs, repackage those, those, uh, that DNA. At a rate of up to 250,000 new cells per second. 250,000 cells per second. So there is an energetic consciousness that is developing our fetal body. And to me, that is the consciousness of the universe in every cell of our being. And then once we're born, our two emotional systems come online. And then we have that thinking rational brain that begins to develop after generally, you know, at least probably six months after we are born. So, so, so here so we are here with this consciousness, consciousness of the universe inside of each one of us. And at the time of death, what happens? We detach from the real world, we detach from our emotions, and we shift back into the consciousness of that right thinking brain, which is our ability to experience that cosmic consciousness. So to me, it's, it's a, we truly are a droplet from the ocean and then we dissolve back into that ocean again. So energetically, I think death is just this beautiful natural process. We come from, from into life and we go right back into death and it's love. I truly believe it's an overwhelming feeling and experience of love. Yes. Well, you put it beautifully. It's almost like I'm not scared anymore from death, but no, I'm going to tell people all suicide, guys. We have things to do in this world as well. So we're busy. We're busy. Yes. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're busy. And, and the thing is that when you think about eternity and how long eternity is and how tiny our little lives are, even if we get a hundred years in this form, we are here to stimulate and be stimulated by. We have the capacity to see and to hear and to speak and to grow and to learn, to love one another, to procreate and have families, to love people. I mean, this gift of life is this amazing thing that really, even if we get a hundred years, we've had no time at all. So this is a precious, we will be dead soon enough for an eternity of time. And you know, but this, this precious, precious ability to look into one another's eyes, to hold and touch one another's hands and to say, you are so beautiful. And I am so grateful that you and I share time and space right now. To me, that's the beauty of life. Well, that's, that's it for me. It's a great message to maybe, and I have people here helping me. They're hugging each other. I'm looking at them. <laughs> I hope everyone who's listening to us hugging each other right now. And then, uh, I mean, Jill, I cannot tell you this message is so great. 
touch so many people's lives hearts hopefully yeah. and um and and i i have a friend here come visiting me from actually her uh son suicided very not long ago so she's mm -hmm. here hearing that for her is very good she's oh. waiting for you yes and um good. thank you so much now do you have anything i don't want to uh tire jill i mean i love you jill i'm gonna yeah. keep you if if i can like hours and hours here and i'm sure people are too but we will have you soon promise us please you're gonna get come again and we'll answer do it again. Questions. yes so we'll honest. do it again we'll do it again yes yeah yes happy to you're so very happy to and then Sinan, i'm gonna ask you uh, can you hear me when i'm talking hear me yes, okay sir. When you're experiencing something like this, full of emotion, wisdom, and information, the best thing to do is to go to a silent place and contemplate on them. So I don't want to talk on this uh, anymore because there was a marvelous meeting. We love you, Jill. Yeah, because Thank you. you I feel, feel love. Uh, I feel that. Mo from the most of the people you you experienced that uh, with an accident but uh, it changed you forever and also thanks for this fate of yours because it changed us also some something touched you and also uh, towards you touched us it's very nice to have you here so i i'm going to go before i go to bed i will contemplate on this and i advise to all yeah. our audiences that do the same thing just just don't go open up another channel and watch anything else just think about what you heard think think about what you felt most importantly because what you felt yeah. is the real thing thank you very much for being with us we are very very oh, grateful thank you and thank hugs you. from yeah, turkey I, was, yes we give you hugs hugs yes <laughs> The whole universe, we give a for of you. Thank you so much, Jill. Perfect. Thank you, Sinan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank All you these everyone. great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them, but you are. You guys are great. Jill promised us she's going to come again and watch us again. Welcome. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Sinan. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.